Hello everyone, welcome back. My name is Arius, and today we're going to be talking about synthetic biology company, Ginkgo Bioworks. We will talk about what they do, both broadly at the platform level and with some detailed case studies of programs, as well as some financial projections, and I'll show you whether or not their valuation makes sense. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy this type of content, and leave any video suggestions and feedback in the comments below. And without further ado, let's get into it. As I stated before, Ginkgo Bioworks is a synthetic biology company. Their stated goal is to make biology easily programmable. I believe there are almost an unlimited amount of applications for this technology and that it will be extremely impactful over the next few decades. Now what exactly does it mean to engineer biology? On the most basic level, cells run on the code in the form of DNA, and each cell's DNA contains all the information it needs to tell the cells exactly what to do. Now what if scientists could easily write new DNA code to tell the cell to do something else, like for example produce a cannabinoid instead of an alcohol, or make a key mRNA vaccine component, both of which we will cover later on. This would be an extremely valuable ability to have, and this is exactly what Ginkgo is developing. There will be two ways that Ginkgo makes money, the first of which is foundry fees, which is a flat fee for research being done by Ginkgo for another company. My hope is that these payments will cover expenses of the company and maybe turn a small profit, but leave the making of the big bucks to the other way of requiring value, and that is through taking royalties of Ginkgo engineering products in the market or taking equity in companies who use Ginkgo's platform. The final part of their company is what they call biosecurity, where Ginkgo is running many state surveillance testings in K-12 schools for COVID-19. This is a very uncertain part of their business going forward as it heavily depends on the path that the pandemic takes. However, it may have a long-term positive effect on Ginkgo as having a biosecurity platform may be part of a national security interests going forward. And Ginkgo has expertise to play a role here, but for now I will ignore its effects on Ginkgo's future valuation. Let's talk now about Ginkgo's platform as it is what will set them apart in the years to come. It comes in two main parts, Foundry and Codebase. Foundry is Ginkgo's highly automated research facility in Boston, Massachusetts. The level of automation is what really sets this facility apart from just being another lab. This also, of course, comes with many talented and capable people to run the lab, and their expertise is of vital importance to Ginkgo going forward. According to the team at Ginkgo, while they have been relentless in their automation efforts thus far, they still have some quote-unquote easy wins on this front and should be able to keep costs falling according to what they have deemed Knight's Law. Knight's Law, named after one of their co-founders, Tom Knight, says that the cost to any genetically engineered cell decreases by 50% every year, and the number of designs tested increases by 3x every year. Foundry is currently one of Ginkgo's biggest advantages and will continue to be as they keep dropping costs and increasing throughput. You can see Knight's Law in action here with these three charts. First, lab operations increasing 2 to 3x per year as strains tested increased 3 to 4x per year before COVID interrupted the improvement. On this slide, you can see the costs falling on a log scale. Currently, they are 5 to 10x cheaper than doing the same operations by hand, and they are projecting this to increase to 100 times by 2025. This scale will bring sustainable competitive advantages over other companies who are trying to compete with their own programs, employing PhDs to do the work by hand and not with a scaled lab program. Their second advantage is what they call Codebase. Ginkgo has been developing Codebase through their whole existence. Every time they find success in the development of a program, they can save that and use it in further projects. Management talks about this as creating CDKs or cell development kits, the DNA version of an SEK or a software development kit. And to be clear, while consumers get their full rights to commercialize the developed cell line. Ginkgo keeps the key learnings used to make this possible and can use them in the future products. The combination of a state-of-the-art lab and a flywheel of learning from other successful programs will allow Ginkgo to excel going forward. Now I'm going to talk about the four programs at various stages of completion that I think are indicative of how broad the application of Ginkgo's technology could be. The first program was developed in partnership with Kronos Group, a Canadian cannabis company. They have genetically engineered yeast to be brewed at a commercial scale, and if successful, they are targeting drastic reductions in cost per kilogram of product. They are targeting eight specific molecules to be cultivated as part of two main programs. As they successfully complete the development of each of these targets, they will unlock milestone payments in Kronos stock. They just unlocked the first of these milestone payments by completing development of CBGA, which Kronos expects to commercialize by the fall time. At that time, Ginkgo will receive 1.5 million shares, or about $9 million worth of Kronos stock. These milestone payments will be in addition to the approximately 20 12 million Kronos already paid to Ginkgo in foundry fees. Before we move on to the next slide, let's talk a bit about the big picture effects that the success of their program would create. Let's say that Ginkgo can successfully create a strain of yeast that successfully makes the targeted cannabinoids that Kronos is looking to develop for the targeted reduced cost of $1,000 per kilogram versus the current standard of $1,600 per kilogram. If this was successfully commercialized by Kronos into a product that consumers actually wanted, a few things would happen. First, Kronos would be able to make the product for significantly less competitors, and this would allow them to enjoy fat profit margins or lower their 
their cost to consumers or a little bit of both. The success of this program would also lead to an increase in value for Kronos shareholders, of which Ginkgo is now one of. It would also catalyze Kronos to look for more collaborations with Ginkgo, which would also be great for them. Kronos' competitors would also be faced with the tough choice of trying to compete with their traditional product or develop their own in-house. Or alternatively, they could use Ginkgo's to develop another strain for a different target for them, which would only drive more business for Ginkgo long-term. I hope you can start to see the long-term positive effects that the success of one program would have for Ginkgo. The second case study is a partnership with Aldevron to produce vaccine capping enzyme, or VCE, which is a key component in making mRNA vaccines, like those produced by Pfizer and Moderna. They have achieved a 10x improvement in production efficiency of vaccine capping enzyme, which is a truly astounding result. They did this work for no foundry fee in 2020 in an effort to do their part in ending the global pandemic. However, they will receive royalties, the rates of which far exceed what are typical in the biopharma industry. These royalties will increase as they achieve further process improvements and provide Ginkgo with a strong recurring revenue opportunity. This is another example of how versatile Ginkgo's potential product map is, spanning from cannabinoids to next generation vaccine components. In our third case study, we'll be looking at Motif Foodworks, which was spun out of Ginkgo in 2018, but has just recently raised $226 million in Series B funding. Needless to say, this is a lot of money. They claim to be focused on lowering costs and improving food quality in the plant-based food alternative space, and they've been spending a lot of money with Ginkgo to do this, spending $19 and $21 million in foundry fees in 2019 and 2020, respectively. Ginkgo has stated that they take about a 30% stake in startups whose sole business proposition is to build off Ginkgo's platform, and I would guess that they started with at least a 30% stake in Motif. While we do not have a firm valuation of Motif, another plant-based alternative company, Oatly, raised $200 million at a $2 billion valuation and then went public and is currently trading for around $10 million. However, they are much further along in their commercialization process. If we assume Motif's most recent round was at least $2 billion valuation and Ginkgo had been diluted down to a 20% ownership, that would value Ginkgo's stake at about $400 million. While this is a very inexact number and I don't take these numbers very seriously, it illustrates how Ginkgo's platform can create significant value going forward. In our last case study, we'll be looking at what I think is by far the coolest thing that I've heard Ginkgo working on. Join Bio is a partnership with Bayer to attempt to break into the nitrogen fertilizer market in an extremely innovative way. This nitrogen fertilizer market currently uses 4% of the world's natural gas and is the cause of much runoff pollution. Join Bio looks to solve this problem by looking to nature for inspiration. As you may know, some plants, especially in the legume family, like peas and beans, for example, have symbiotic nitrogen-fixing microbes that grow on their roots, naturally fixing nitrogen from the air back into the soil, where it can be used by the plants. This is why peas are often used as a cover crop between plantings of harvest crops as they naturally fertilize the land. Of course, there's no time for this in today's industrial farming methods, so they spread expensive and dirty synthetic nitrogen fertilizer every year to maximize crop output. Join Bio aims to bring nitrogen fixing capabilities of peas to major cereal crops that provide the majority of the world's caloric intake, corn, rice, and wheat. They would genetically engineer microbes to serve the same purpose as they do on the roots of peas, but now on the roots of these major cereal crops. Imagine how much more valuable these crops would be if a particular strain of wheat didn't need much or needed much less nitrogen fertilizer. Farmers without this strain would need to spend valuable time and money fertilizing their crops while farmers with the joint bio crops wouldn't have to, therefore making them willing to pay more for joint bio strain of crop. It also serves to solve some of the late year fertilizer problem as it is difficult to add more fertilizer later in the year just as crops are getting close to harvest time. They also have the secondary goal of pest control and disease resistance. This is by far the coolest and most exciting program that Ginkgo is working on in my opinion and I can't wait to see how it plays out. These case studies are just a few of the programs than Ginkgo is in the works. They have five programs that have already gone into the market and have been commercialized, mostly from the fragrances market. They also have a partnership with Corteva, developing crop protection agents, which I think is big potential going forward. Recently, their management has mentioned their involvement in the therapeutic space, and I would look for this to be a big part of their growth going forward as well. Now, with the knowledge of all of these diverse programs, let's rewind back to when I introduced the concept of Ginkgo's code base. Ginkgo is developing yeast that grows weed, nitrogen-fixing symbiotic microbes, and key components in the mRNA vaccine supply chain. The expertise developed in developing these products will be part of Ginkgo's competitive advantage going forward. Before we move on to talking about the management, I just want to drill home how diverse the amount of different problems that Ginkgo is working on and how big the markets are that these could address. They are working with both established companies and startups in enormous markets, including pharma, biotech, food and agriculture, and industrial. I predict as they start to have success in each industry, this will create a domino effect forcing more and more companies in each space that they have success in to continue working with Ginkgo or somehow use synthetic biology because without it, they will struggle to compete with companies who are using it. A quick note of their management team before we move on to the financials. They have a fairly unique five-person founding team that is still worth the company to this day. This is in itself a good sign that five people could work together from the company's formation in around 2006 until present day, which shows their commitment to the mission. When I listen to any of the founders talk, they are all very well-spoken and obviously technical 
equally involved in their work. Jason Kelly, the CEO in particular, is excellent at explaining SynBio in a very simple, dumbed-down way that almost anyone could understand, and this will be important for building an investor base going forward. Of course, while Ginkgo has executed admirably so far with such a large technical challenge, I would need to see a continuing track record of this going forward if I am to keep Ginkgo as a long-term holding. Now let's go over their SPAC deal, which completed their merger with Soaring Eagle Acquisition Company in mid-September, raising cash of $2.5 billion. This drastically improves their capital position going forward, and it will be interesting to see if they increase capital spending on building out a new laboratory with this injection of capital. The sponsors have decided to take one-third of their sponsor pay and convert it to earnout, vesting between $12.50 and $20, which is of course a bullish sign going forward for Ginkgo stock price. Lastly, for this slide, I have found it notable that two other people that I have independently respect for who were not already directly involved with Ginkgo have already been board members since 2016. These two people are Christian Henry, a new CEO for PacBio, who has done an excellent job thus far, and Palantir's COO, Shyam Sankar. It is of course a good sign to see impressive business people like these being involved with Ginkgo. Now that we have established that Ginkgo is an exceptional company, let's try to project Ginkgo's revenue going forward to get a sense of whether or not their current valuation is deserved. Luckily, Ginkgo provided five-year projections in their original SPAC slide deck. They projected accelerating year-over-year -year revenue growth to continue to 2023 and then decelerating growth rates as they finally break a billion in foundry revenues in 2025. Also in 25, they expect to become an adjusted EBITDA profitable for the first time, while they expect CapEx to ramp smoothly all the way out to 2025. Keep in mind that this just accounts for foundry revenue and they will also be taking part of the upside in the success of their downstream programs. And while they did not provide specific projections for the value generated by these programs, past 2020, they did provide a net present value that they assigned to each program currently, and projections of how many programs they would sign each year going out to 2025, where they expect to sign 500 new programs that year, a 90% increase from the year prior. They also said that the value per program would increase if they are successful at a higher rate. I would expect this success rate to increase as Kinga develops more expertise. We will use both of these numbers in the coming slide to help us understand the valuation. One final observation that we can take from this slide is that when we get close to 2025, the foundry revenue growth slows. However, the number of new programs per year continues to grow at an elevated rate. This shows that Ginkgo plans to pass on their savings from Knight's Law to their customers, opening up their platform to a more broad set of potential customers. Let's first look at the foundry revenues and model that out to 2030. Let's say we accept their projections from the last slide and they reach approximately $1.1 billion in revenue in 2025, growing at a 75% rate. If we taper that rate down, having them grow at a 30% rate year over year in 2030 and 2031, that would have them make $8.4 billion in revenue. If you apply a 5 price to sales ratio, that would imply a $42 billion 2031 valuation, which is only a 10% CAGR over the next 10 years. If we value it based off earnings with a 25% 2031 adjusted EBITDA margin and a 35 times ratio off of that, it would apply a slightly larger $74 billion valuation with a 50% CAGR. I think it's safe to say that this valuation is stretched just based off foundry fees alone, but now let's try to include the downstream revenue from the programs. Going back to Ginkgo's projection slide, they are projecting 90% year-over-year growth in the number of programs out to 2025, where they think they will sign over 500 new programs. If we continue to model that 90% growth in new programs per year, tapering down to 35% growth in 2031 from 70% in 2026, this would project them starting over 5,000 new programs in 2031. To get the net present value projected out to 2031, we'll take the $15 million net present value that they have placed on programs in 2020, and to be conservative, say that it stays constant out to 2025, and then project modest growth of 8 to 12%. This would place a $27 million net present value for every program. Roughly 5,600 programs at $27 million per program would mean that they are producing $151 billion in net present value each year. That on its own would justify a 10x in Ginkgo's valuation, not to mention the billions in value over the past decade. This is what makes Ginkgo an intriguing proposition even at the current valuation. If you add up the current values of these programs over just these five years, it would be over $400 billion in value created. Now, if you're rightfully skeptical that that much value could be had by one company, look at this chart Ginkgo put out about the direct economic impact that they could have in each of these sectors. Cetera Biology is a huge opportunity and Ginkgo has the best platform to take advantage of this opportunity. Before we get on to my conclusions, I just want to bring you up to date on the company's most recent communications. They did a first half of the year update in June that I will link in the description along with all the other resources used in the creation of this video. And in that update, they raised both their guidance for their number of new programs initiated in 2021 and for their biosecurity security revenue. This is excellent news to hear them raising guidance already as they are now projecting 66% year over year growth in the number of new programs this year versus last. On to my conclusions. Synthetic biology is one of the most ambitious endeavors I've ever seen. 
It is a vast array of potential applications, and Ginkgo intends to take advantage of all them by partnering with already established players in each of the target areas. Ginkgo has built a tremendous platform, and that is what will provide value going forward. Most importantly, they have an extremely ambitious managed team that has executed well so far. This is, of course, the key to their success going forward, and I will need to see Ginkgo continue to hit their announced targets to continue to have confidence in the company. It is also important to keep in mind this is still incredibly early with synthetic biologies, so early in fact that it's been equated with the 1960s of computers. Thus, there are plenty of risks that come with purchasing Ginkgo, and this will not be a smooth write-up. However, I see plenty of upside and then some to justify those risks, and I will be very happy holder of Ginkgo long-term. It currently makes up about 2% of my portfolio, and I intend to grow this until it makes up 4 or 5% of my portfolio. My current cost basis is not 969, and I intend to double this position going forward. Thanks for watching. What do you think of Ginkgo? How big is their potential? Are you interested in owning the stock? And what is your 5 to 10 year price targets? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. My goal is to get to 1,000 subscribers as soon as possible, and I'd love to have you along for a ride. Thanks again for watching, and have a great rest of your day.